Welcome to EQ1 of the water cycle and water insecurity. Um, this recording will be useful for your revision of the water cycle and water insecurity topic. And this particular recording is for the inquiry question one section of that topic. An inquiry question one asks, what are the processes operating within the hydrological cycle from global to local scale? This is not a replacement of lesson learning. This is not detailed enough to constitute covering the entire topic in real detail. However, it will be useful for you in going through the stages of each inquiry question and supporting you with wider reading and wider revision. So first thing to note and the most important thing to note about the water cycle topic is the actual water cycle or hydrological cycle itself and there's an image here for you on the screen of a detailed and annotated water cycle so there's a number of different stages throughout the water cycle obviously um if we think about we'll start at the bottom here if we think about the hydrosphere the ocean that's around 97 percent of the earth's water uh, from the ocean we know that evaporation takes place because of the heat from the sun uh, radiating on that water. We know that evaporation causes condensation and clouds to form and fog to form and water vapour in the atmosphere, which eventually will cause rain. We know that precipitation therefore takes place and that is like the deposition of water from the atmosphere. So the droplets fall, whether that be rain, sleet, hail or snow, onto the land surface. We know that in higher altitudes, um, where there is a mountainous range, for example, we will get the accumulation of snow and we will get ice. We'll also have snow melt and melt water going into rivers towards the sea um, and therefore the deposition of that water again. We also know that a few processes take place during this, namely surface runoff, channel runoff, reservoirs being constructed naturally and by humans. And we also know that because of the plant soil and trees that may exist on the landscape, that plant uptake or absorption or infiltration and interception takes place. So the water is taken by the plants through the stomata of the leaves, through the roots, etc. And used by those plants. We also know that infiltration takes place where the water is soaked into the ground and that seeps straight down towards the bedrock. And really, that is the process of the water cycle in a nutshell. You need to be aware of those very key terms uh, that are related to the water cycle. So these would be particularly the uh, blue writing around this water cycle that you see in front of you. And you just need to be aware of the overall process and how it works. Now, the global water stores on earth you need to be aware of the four main stores that are on screen now for you so they are the hydrosphere the atmosphere the cryosphere and the lithosphere now the hydrosphere is all of the waters on the earth's surface so that's the rivers seas lakes ponds river etc okay and uh, the atmosphere is all the air above us the cryosphere is the ice on earth and the lithosphere is, if you think about it, like the crust from plate tectonics. It's the outer layer of the Earth. It's that rocky layer. You also need to be aware of how much each four of these sections make up in terms of total water storage as a percentage. So the hydrosphere, for example, is 96.5% of the Earth's global water stores. The atmosphere is 0.001%. So it's a very small store of water. And that's constantly in flux as well because of precipitation. The cryosphere is around 1.7% of all of the Earth's water storage. And the lithosphere is also around 1.7%. Now, all of this constitutes a very limited availability of fresh water on Earth. And fresh water, of course, is the water that we need for human consumption. So in terms of total global water, um, there is only really water accessible to humans on the hydrosphere. 96.5% um, of all of the water that is accessible to humans is ocean water. Okay. 
Now, of the Earth's fresh water supply, the Earth only, therefore, has 2.5% of all of its water as fresh water supply. So only 2.5% of all of the world's water is fresh water. And of that 2.5%, only 1.2 is actually, therefore, usable by us. OK, so that's surface water that we can actually get to. And therefore, the amount of actual accessible fresh water of that 1.2% of the Earth is actually only 1%. Essentially, to summarise that, Accessible fresh water on Earth is a very tiny total amount of the actual global water surface and storage of the Earth. So we are talking about a very minute section of the Earth's water that we can actually extract, use wisely and actually for it to be safe to use. Now, in terms of the hydrological cycle, there are inputs and flows and fluxes and outputs. Now, the fluxes, which refers to the types of movement of the water in the hydrological cycle, are mainly surrounding precipitation, so rainfall, for example, surface runoff towards oceans, seas and rivers, and evapotranspiration through plants. The main inputs in the hydrological cycle is precipitation as well and below in a couple of seconds we will go through the types of precipitation and finally for outputs the main outputs of the hydrological cycle are through evaporation transpiration and discharge in rivers and seas now back to our inputs the main input as we said is precipitation so rain sleet hail and snow and there are three types of rainfall just to be aware of that can affect and that can take place in the hydrological cycle. So let's start with relief rainfall on the left. Relief rainfall is rainfall that occurs because of landscape shape or topography. And the main and key thing to remember about relief rainfall is that it happens because of the change in temperature of the air that rises alongside the hill or mountain. So the air cools and condenses as it moves up in the atmosphere, forms clouds, rainfall therefore exists as a result. So that is relief rainfall and it happens because of the shape of the land. Convectional rainfall, on the other hand, is rainfall that happens because of warmth in the air that rises. So as the warmth in the air rises, and you can see here the land is completely flat, um, that warmth will rise because warm air always rises. It's bound therefore to get cooler as it rises in the atmosphere, forms clouds and rainfall therefore can occur. And we get these on really warm days, these types of rainfall. And then finally, frontal rainfall. Now frontal rainfall is to do with weather fronts. So this is mainly to do with warm air fronts meeting cooler air fronts. So as you can see, there is a warm air front on, the, on this diagram. OK, and the warm air front meets a cooler air front. The warm air therefore has to rise ok, because the cool air is falling. That's more dense. The warm air rises and along that front, the two airs mix to form rainfall. And the rainfall on a frontal uh, zone is usually heavy rainfall. So they're the three types of rainfall and they essentially are the main inputs of water into a hydrological cycle. And finally, in terms of the flows that we see, in other words, the actual movement of water within the hydrological cycle, there are seven main types. Before I go through these, just remember that the flows is the movement of the water, whereas the flux is the way in which it moves. So we're just talking about what actually moves here. And we've got seven different flows to consider. So first of all, interception and that is where the plant literally or the soil intercepts the water okay it retains the water infiltration is where the water actually soaks into that plant and soil percolation is the transfer of water deep into the soil and bedrock so this is where it moves further down the soil into the bedrock 
We've also got through flow, and this is a lateral movement or a transfer of water down slope because of the shape of the land. Then we've got groundwater flow, and this is a very slow transfer of percolated water. So this is a very slow movement of water that moves into the bedrock and flows along that bedrock. We then got surface runoff and this is the movement of water over land and this may be because the land is already saturated for example. And finally we've got river or channel flow and this is when water simply enters a river or a channel um, and it flows towards the ocean or sea through that river or channel. Now, in terms of drainage basins, which are the areas surrounding a river, there are a few physical factors that affect what drainage basins will be like. OK, so let's talk about climate to start with. The climate of an area mainly affects the input and output of a drainage basin. So what goes into the drainage basin and what comes out. If it's a very wet climate, for example, lots will go into the drainage basin and lots will come out. If it's a drier climate, the opposite, less will go into, there will be less input into the drainage basin and less out of it. And of course, this changes the amount and type of precipitation that a place might get and therefore the amount of evaporation that also happens. So that's how climate can affect a drainage basin. In terms of soil, um, soil affects the importance of different flows in a system. For example, surface runoff. So if it's a type of soil that is very absorptive and it can absorb material, water particularly, really well, then that will affect the actual flow of water in the system. If it's a soil that doesn't absorb water very well, there will be more runoff occurring in that area. And essentially, all you've got to remember about this is that soil determines infiltration rates. Soil determines how much water can be infiltrated and therefore absorbed into that soil. Another one to think about that affects the drainage basin is geology. So the rock type of an area that mainly affects surface runoff because rocks that are impermeable, for example, and therefore water can pass through, will have much more runoff. And that impacts the percolation rates and the groundwater flow rates as well. And geology also, remember, affects soil formation because the soil comes from essentially the rock that exists there. In terms of relief, which means shape of the land, that also affects surface runoff. So if you've got a, a slopey landscape um, with a steep slope, then surface runoff is much likely to occur much quicker. Um, this impacts the amount of precipitation too because of relief rainfall versus convectional rainfall, for example. At, at a relief, at a type of relief, for example, where you have lots of hills, you are likely to get relief rainfall and therefore more rainfall than potentially somewhere else. And finally, for vegetation, which is plants, again, these affect surface runoff because vegetation, as we know, um, can allow the water to be infiltrated can allow interception to take place and evapotranspiration and so on. Um, the presence of plants, therefore, is really important in determining what the drainage basin's characteristics will be like. So these five characteristics, climate, soil, geology, relief and vegetation, all impact the type of drainage basin we will see and what happens in that drainage basin. Now, the human factors that affect drainage basins, what is it that we do that impact on what drainage basins will be like? So there are a couple here. So let's start with river management. So we tend to, as humans, construct reservoirs, use that for domestic supply, use water in rivers for irrigation of crops, etc. And therefore, all of this is removing water from its natural place. And even though it may end up back there, at some point that is disrupting the general flow of the hydrological cycle. Deforestation is a really key disruption to the hydrological cycle and drainage basins because what it does is it, it reduces the amount of evapotranspiration and transpiration from the plants that exists and therefore there is a general disruption to the hydrological cycle, there is less water put into the atmosphere, there is less therefore rainfall potentially over time. 
But what it also does is it increases infiltration rates. So more, so more water is absorbed by the soil itself. And also it increases surface runoff due to the potential waterlogged nature of the soil that may happen. Remember, the trees or the plants there no longer exist to use the water that's going into the soil effectively. So the soil has a surplus of water. Um, changing landscape, for example, land use in terms of agriculture. Um, so for example, arable to pastoral farming, what you would see is the soil would compact and that would increase runoff. And the opposite goes for pastoral to arable farming. So if we change a farm, for example, to um, crop farming, arable farming, ploughing would have to exist on that farm and that increases infiltration rates because you're loosening the soil, you're allowing the soil to be able to take more water in from precipitation. And finally, the last human impact or human um, activity that could affect a drainage basin would be urbanization. Okay, so things like our use of tarmac, tiles, concrete, etc., all speed up surface runoff and they all increase flooding. And the reason for this is because we are essentially covering the soil with an impermeable material such as tarmac, and that means that the water has to run off that concrete rather than being absorbed by the soil naturally. So just remember the main components in the hydrological cycle, therefore, that are affected by us and river management and deforestation and so on are evaporation, evapotranspiration, interception, infiltration of groundwater and groundwater surface and runoff. OK, so these are the components of the hydrological cycle that are impacted by all of these different activities. Now, just a quick example for you of humans actually modifying the landscape somewhere that has seen these factors. And that is the Amazon Basin. It's a great example to use because it's one of the largest areas of tropical rainforest in the world. And it's also seen one of the largest rates of deforestation since the 1950s. And there are a number of ways we have seen the impact of human use of the landscape in the Amazon. And they include humidity lowering. And that is because there is less evapotranspiration taking place, less water vapour in the atmosphere. Therefore, there is also less precipitation, less rainfall overall. Because we are removing trees, we are compacting the surface and the soil and therefore there's more surface runoff and infiltration taking place. There's also more evaporation and less transpiration taking place. And as you can see in the image here, for example, what you've actually got because the trees have been cut away from this area is a waterlogged area. And that water would usually be used really well by the trees, but in this case it hasn't been because the trees are no longer there. And there is also more soil erosion and silt being fed into rivers. And soil erosion happens because obviously the landscape, as you can see in the image again, is now exposed. So it's exposed to all of the elements. And also the silt is washed away from the landscape surrounding a river and washed into that river. Now, another key focus of inquiry question one is hydrographs and how water actually acts within the system of a river. Now, there are two types of hydrographs. The first one is a flashy hydrograph, and the second one is known as a subdued or flat hydrograph. Let's take a look at the flashy hydrograph first. Now, the flashy hydrograph, as you can see, its main feature is that it has a line here for discharge, and that's the amount of water flowing through the river itself. And as you can see, that discharge line goes quite high quite quickly. OK, so it has a long rate of high peak discharge. Its rising limb is steep and its falling limb is quite steep as well. The lag time is quite short. OK, so the amount of time it takes after the rainfall to get into full flow in the river is quite short. And the base flow shows you what this flow would have looked like without this rainfall or storm event that you can see. 
So a flashy hydrograph, essentially, the key thing to remember is it shows you a storm event taking place with high amounts of rainfall, potentially in a waterlogged area already. And therefore, what you see is a dramatic rise in peak discharge quite quickly. Now, on the other hand, you've got a subdued hydrograph and a subdued hydrograph might take place in an area that has less rainfall. Or there is more slope so that the um, rainfall that gets into the river does it over time rather than all immediately. And so that slows down the flow of that water. And the difference here is really clear to see the rising limb is quite shallow and the falling limb is a slight bit steeper okay so it takes a longer time from the rainfall event the lag time is much longer to get to peak discharge and overall there is much less water in this type of drainage basin or river and therefore what you actually have is a more manageable drainage basin less flooded drainage basin a less changeable drainage basin so the key thing to remember with these two diagrams is to notify or notice the shape. That's the most important thing. And therefore, the peak discharge is different. Now, we want you to have some information on the factors that affect those shapes of those hydrographs. So what is it that makes a flashy hydrograph and what is it that makes a subdued hydrograph? And there are a number of factors that affect the shape of a hydrograph. So let's start with a flashy river. So this is a river, as we said, I'll go back to it, that has a high peak discharge. There is lots of water flowing through or lots of discharge flowing through this river at one time. The water gets to the river quite quickly and through the basin. So a flashy hydrograph. In terms of weather and climate, we'll see intense storms. Um, there will be storms that exceed infiltration. So in other words, a waterlogged area. There might be rapid snow melt. There will be low evaporation rates. In terms of its rock and its soils and its relief, it will usually be impermeable rock. The water does not pass through it down into the soil. The soil will be clay, which doesn't absorb water very well. And the slopes are generally quite steep. In terms of the actual basin characteristics itself, what basin might look like, it's usually going to be a small basin for this, so it can't hold enough water. It's going to be circular in shape on a mountainside or slope, and there will be lots of streams flowing to the main river in this type of basin. In terms of the vegetation, usually you would find that in a flashy hydrograph area, there will be minimal vegetation and it will be of low density and therefore you get low interception rates and low infiltration rates and that's why you have such a surplus of water in the area. In terms of the pre-existing conditions that exist in this basin it may already be wet from a previous storm and the soil may already be saturated hence why there is such an oversupply of water in a flashy hydrographed storm and a flashy hydrographed basin area. And finally, the human activity you might find or see in an area that gets a fl flashy hydrograph or a flashy river would be things like urbanization, concreted areas, deforestation, all of the elements we looked at earlier for the human factors that affect a drainage basin. Now, essentially, a subdued hydrograph or a subdued river is the exact opposite. OK, so that will have. For its weather and climate, steady rainfall, it won't exceed infiltration rates, snow melt will be slow, there will be higher evaporation rates. The rock type would usually be permeable, and that means that water can flow through it into the soil. There usually are sandy soils here that can absorb water or let it pass through quite well, and slopes will be generally gentle or flat. The drainage basin itself will be quite large, generally in a subdued area. Um, it would be an elongated basin and it would have a few streams. It would not have as many streams as in a flashy drainage basin. In terms of vegetation, it would usually be high density. There will be lots of interception taking place. Evapotranspiration will be high and so on. 
The pre-existing conditions more than likely here would also be that the basin was dry and that the water table underneath the basin would be low. So there is enough capacity to store more water and there is enough capacity to be able to absorb more water overall. And finally, for human activity in an area that has a subdued river, generally what you would find is that there will be rural, low population density areas. Reforestation or afforestation might have taken place in this area. Um, so therefore, there is more evapotranspiration that can take place. And there is more roots from trees to be able to absorb and use the water better. In relation to that, we've got to think about water budgets. Now, a water budget is just the annual balance between the amount of rainfall, the amount of evapotranspiration and the runoff that exists in a place. So it's just a balance of those three things. So in other words, the simple way to put that is it's a balance between the inputs into an area and the outputs of an area within the hydrological cycle. Now, there is a formula to help calculate this. And that formula is very simply precipitation equals evapotranspiration plus surface runoff and plus or minus S, which represents the storage over a period of time, which is one year. OK, so you don't need to be able to calculate that and get an answer. You just need to be aware of that's how it's actually created. And the key thing with this is this. It can be calculated globally or locally. It can be calculated within one specific drainage basin in the UK or it can be calculated for a whole desert, okay? It's useful for calculating the amount of water that's available for human use and available soil water. So actually this formula is quite useful for, for example, drought events in the UK. We can actually calculate and water companies can calculate the amount of available water over time and how that's changing due to precipitation changing and therefore how much water we actually can expect to have in storage over time. And for example, what you would find in a polar region is because precipitation is very low, you would have a low annual budget and therefore you would have low availability of water. So that is a brief overview of water budgets. In terms of water regimes, these are different to water budgets. This is the um, annual variation in discharge in a river. OK, so this is the differing amounts each year in the amount of discharge or flow of a river at a particular place. And it's measured in Qmex usually. And the river characteristics usually influences this in a number of ways. And the ways are on screen for you. So the size of the river impacts the water regime. Where it's measured impacts it. The amount, the seasons and the intensities of those rainfalls temperature, the amount of melt water from ice there is, evaporation rates, the types of rock and the types of soil, whether it's impermeable or permeable rock, the amount of vegetation there is, and also the human activities that exist in an area. They all affect the amount of discharge and the annual change in flow of a river that there is in a river. And I've got two examples here just to illustrate to you how this might look. So let's take the Amazon. The Amazon has a um, high flow of water volume in a river between December and May. And that's because it's, it's wet season. And between June and November is the drier season. OK, so low flow would exist between June and November. There is a moderate variability in the seasons in terms of how much water you would expect, in terms of how much annual variation would happen. And in the Amazon, we know that human influence is increasing with urbanisation and deforestation. So what we would expect is that these moderations um, and variabilities within the Amazon are going to increase over time. And then it's almost opposite in a sense, Alaska. Alaska has high flow of water between April and August because of high levels of snowmelt 
because temperatures are higher at that time of year there. And it would have low flow in September to March because ice actually is forming. Temperatures drop, so ice is forming. And what we've got in Alaska is what's called a large flow variability. So the amount of flow at different times of the years varies largely. The amount of water going through the system varies largely. And in the in and in Alaska, there is very very few human influences. It's not a very um, built on landscape. It's not used by humans widely, and therefore, um, it has a lesser impact on Alaska than in the Amazon. So that is the end of EQ1, and that's just a roundup of everything that you looked at in lessons on EQ1. The next session of this will be on EQ2, which is on screen now. So go over EQ1, make sure you're happy with it, listen to this a few times, make sure you get the basic ideas.